Hello, I am Luxbrush. And this is Ember. And this is our thoughts on Bravely Default so far. <laughs> also known as Bravely Default Synonymous. I was planning on doing that too. <laughs> Gameplay. Obviously fun, otherwise we wouldn't be playing the game. <laughs> yeah, they do a very good job of making the fighting system very in-depth, but also easy to pick up. Another thing I like is the fact that you can change the difficulty on the fly. So you can either crank it up so things are more challenging for you, or you can crank it down to just enjoy the story. Or if you're a grinder like me, you can crank up the random encounters to the point of insanity and go, Wee! XP! <laughs> okay, so when you're saying difficulty, you're specifically referring to the adjustability of the encounter rate. Because you can also change the actual overall difficulty settings of the game. I was talking about that too. Okay, now I like the adjustable encounter rate because it makes grinding easy when I feel like I need to level. And when I'm caught up in the story, I can turn it down to normal or lower. And when I'm dying and don't feel like using a teleport stone or my insane stock of recovery items, I can turn it down to zero and limp back to the inn. <laughs> that is a wonderful option to go and grind yourself to almost dead and then turn it off and just walk back and go, Hi! I had like a room at the... N? That'd be 20 bits. Good! Here's the money. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if we actually looked like how our characters look at the end of those battles, the innkeepers would probably turn us away. <laughs> and isn't it just like anime, where band-aids heal, band heal everything? Except in an RPG, it's like, A good night's sleep, and I'm fine! I was missing a limb yesterday. It grew back overnight! Oh, that is a long-standing tradition of the RPG. Stay in a hotel, sleep in a tent, find an inn, and you're all better. I also like the autoplay system where you can set a specific set of commands for your characters to do. So it makes grinding even easier, so you just hit the set up the commands for one battle, and then you hit auto for all the rest of the grinding. So you're pretty much just walking around in a circle and hitting A at the stat screen where they tell you, oh, you got this much gold, you got this much experience, and you have this many job points. Though I think they're a bit stingy on the job points. That or I'm not far enough in the game and I grind too much. Well, I don't grind nearly as much as you, but I'm still going, come on, give me more job points. And I've over-leveled my rebuilding of Narende, and there are items that will let you get more of different kind of points, but they cost so much money. <laughs> it's like, by the time I have that much money, I bet I've beaten the game. Uh, and that brings me to the other point of, usually I grind for XP, but in this game, I'm grinding for two other things. XP in my job class, and money. <laughs> Same here. It was like, oh, I gained a level. I don't care. How many job points did I get? Do I have enough money to buy a new weapon? <laughs> uh, and me and you also seem to have um, two different play styles. I seem to grind to the point of insanity because there was this one point where a bad guy critted on me for one HP. Yeah, I felt so sorry for him because then I critted on him for over 4,000. Uh, to me, that's just not as fun. I want at least the boss battles to feel challenging. I mean. If my characters are dying in a battle, I probably went back and did some grinding or changed my tactics. Mainly because I don't want any of my characters to fall behind in leveling. And it's like, if I don't have a chance to phoenix down them by the end of the battle, then they missed out on their share of points. And that battle was just a waste for whoever was KO'd. Mm. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to how stingy they are with the job points. It makes you just not want to switch their jobs as often as you should want to. Now, in the demo, I switched job classes a lot. Well, you also mastered at a much earlier level, so I was switching job classes constantly. I have done some switching, mainly out of 
impatience of, okay, I really wanted to get this job class to this level before I switch this character, but I really want the advantages of the other job class, so okay, I'll switch at least for a little while. It, it levels up quickly at the beginning. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And since we're kind of on it, uh, do we want to go a little more in-depth on the job classes? Yeah, I was just about to move on to that myself. Uh, so far, the job classes seem to be pretty balanced. I love how they change your stats slightly, especially as the job levels up, because it actually warns you at one point that you do realize that if you switch out job classes, it will change your stats for a little bit until you level that job up, right? Which to me is, it's, an, it's a nice touch. But it's also a disincentive to change job classes and definitely make sure that I don't change everyone at the same time. Yeah, I usually switch them out when they get to level 10 of their job class, especially since I'm in an area that I found has a good stock of creatures that give me on average about 30 job points. Uh, so far, the highest I've gotten anyone is level 9. My highest so far in job is level 11. I haven't gotten much higher than that because I switched that out to someone else to do some more leveling on another. Yeah, I switched my white, it was my white mage. My white mage is now the level 11 job class, and I switched it out to summoner to get that class up. I'm missing some of the job classes that I enjoyed having in the demo. I'm kind of like, but okay, this job class is nice, but I really like this character in this job. When do I, oh, that's who's holding that job class? I'm going to be like three quarters of the way through the game before I get to touch that. I also like how you have a tendency to pick your job classes based on how they look. Yes, I'm a bit shallow. This game is very visual, and in the beginning of the demo and in the beginning of the full game, I picked my job classes based on how much I like the costume for the character. I'm having trouble right now with the merchant class because I really don't care for the female costumes, but I went ahead and made one of my female characters a merchant because that was the character I was most willing to change job class, and I'm trying to earn more money. Yeah, actually when I first got the merchant class, I changed out one just to get a little bit of extra money, and maxed out that one at, well, maxed up for me anyways, at level 10 for job class, and then I switched her out so I could get, I mean they got her up to that level so I could get the more money, as I call it, ability. That's actually what the game calls it, and I've been waiting go each job level i've been going come on more money as a supportability no dang it okay next level more money as a supportability nope dang it uh, and then later i switched out two more of my people to be merchants for a little bit because i was like i'm gonna gain some more money so i can buy this nasty looking sword from my town yeah i really really want that sword i have two merchants right now i really want that sword Oh, and speaking of the town, that is a nice little addition to the game there, where you rebuild your hometown, you get special items, and every once in a while they give you little gifts, like support items or stuff like that. It's very nice, and considering how tight this game feels with money, it has been a very nice money saver, because I haven't purchased any recovery items. All my recovery items have been either gifts from the town or what I found in treasure chests. Yeah, the only recovery items I've actually really used is mostly the Echo Herb, because silence is my nemesis. Mm. Silence is annoying, but I actually have a support ability nullify silence on my Black Mage. Yeah, I should make sure my... Wait a minute, I think I have that support ability for my White Mage. I should make sure to equip that. <laughs> Since she, has, she now has the magic spell that allows her to heal any status effect, as long as she's not silenced. Yeah, so you make sure your mage can't get silenced, and then your mage can heal or attack anyone else. And since we're talking about classes, my favorite classes so far are Thief, are the Thief, the Ranger, and the Black Mage. I'm really enjoying Thief so far. I think I'd like to put someone else into the Thief class, but I want to level up my current Thief more. I haven't used Spell Fencer yet, but I'm liking the look of it. I have a character in mind for Spellfencer, because I'm like, wait, you get sword fighting and magic? Oh, going back to disliking costumes, I really, really don't want, like the way the time mages look. I will totally agree with you there. That my main complaint is that headpiece. Yes, that's my main complaint too. That headpiece is just god-awful. When I first ran into the character, I was like, 
Oh god, that's a time mage, isn't it? Please change the costume when I get it. Please change the costume when I get it. No, they didn't change the costume when I got it. Damn it! Uh. It's ugly! <laughs> No, and we have the male and female differences in the costume, and it just, they kept the headpiece. Like, uh, really? Yeah, if they would have gotten rid of that headpiece and made it like a, a, a medallion or something around the neck, I would have been perfectly fine. It's just that headpiece completely ruins the outfit for me. Yeah, I really don't like it, but it, it, which is too bad because the body of the costume and the cape are both nice. Mm hmm, but I guess they were going for the pun of you are the face of the clock i know and you know if i can put my female characters in the merchant costume i'm sure at some point i can bring myself to train somebody as a time mage yeah which i i'm still trying to figure out how time mages work since there really isn't any speed per se other than quote unquote the speed of the character i guess if you used a time mage on a thief and the thief used his flash attack i think it's called or whatever ability where he gets higher percentages of damage if he's faster than everyone else when he uses this uh, attack ability. So I guess if you put Rush, or Haste, I should say, on your Thief, and then your Thief uses that move, plus his already 20% increase in speed, he probably could do massive damage. Not that he already doesn't do massive damage. I have mine equipped with a bow that he is just doing massive amounts of damage. Yeah, and I've finally bought that bow. <laughs> And it's ridiculous. I still can't find anything that gives him better stats than that. Because <laughs> it says his best class is Dagger, but he seems to prefer bows. Yeah, I've noticed that the class that's best for the character and the weapons that I have access to that give them the best stats don't always match up. And part of that, I think, is that I've had such a good cache of supplies because I got all the demo bonuses, so I've... I had a good set of weapons to choose from in the first place. Oh, I gotta say, even though I'm the grinder, you're the one who maxed out the demo. <laughs> yeah, I mainly maxed out the demo because I didn't have the game yet. It took you a while to get it because you were trying to find a good price, right? I was trying to find a good price and I was holding out hope that I might be able to score a collector's edition since I didn't have a 3DS yet when the collector's edition was easily available. Mm -hmm. and I hadn't played the demo yet after I had the 3DS and the collector's edition was still reasonably available. Yeah, I'm kind of bummed that I missed out on the special edition too, or collector's edition I should say. Yeah, it looks really interesting and at least the game's awesome and the fact that the collector's edition is ridiculously hard to get a hold of, at least it points out that the game is doing well. Yes, very well. It deserves it, because it is a good game. Moving on to the fact that this game has a really nice addition to the standard RPG system, the Brave and Default system, which I abuse heavily. <laughs> Most definitely. I am constantly braving out my characters, and depending on what type of battle situation I'm doing, I'm very rarely defaulting. It really speeds up the turn-based RPG gameplay and adds another level of strategy because your opponents can also brave in default. Yeah, I myself usually ha have at least three of my members completely braved out and usually my white mage defaults. She's the one who can take extra damage while she's defaulted and she can heal everyone while they're recovering their brave points. Though I gotta say, usually one of my characters usually wipes out the entire enemy party before anyone else gets a chance. Yeah, but that's not what was happening in the beginning of the game. In the beginning of the game, it was a lot more strategy. Now we have a character who is overpowered for where we're at in the game, and we're usually getting one turn unscathed with having only used one character. Though, going back to how you talked about you like to have a bit of challenge with the bosses, I usually get that even though I'm usually insanely leveled by the time I get to them because this one character doesn't always completely outright kills the boss but damages them enough that they usually get a turn. The last battle I had the boss defaulted and gave me a chance to go oh wait I happen to have three bravely seconds saved up let's use all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and now moving on to bravely seconds what do you think about that system and the fact that if you want to you can get more by spending money on it. I'm not usually a fan of monetizing a game 
And I like how they've handled it here because the Bravely Second points are not required for gameplay and you can earn them within the game by keeping the game in sleep mode. Yeah, I'm usually not a big fan of microtransactions myself. I'm glad they made it so you could earn them without having to actually buy money with them. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have used it at all. Yeah, so far I've only used it once, and that was because the tutorial went, hey, do this. I really forget about it because it wasn't part of the demo. Oh yeah, and the game has that nice little system in it that has you like side quests, side quests, they're like mini side quests where it basically has a little menu that says, oh, if you do this, we'll give you this, which is kind of fun because it gives you like little bonuses here. Now, I do have to nitpick the tutorial quests a little bit because they're not keeping pace with how I'm playing the game. When a tutorial quest opens, half the time I've already done the requested action but because I didn't do it when the quest was available, I have to go and repeat the action. Like teleport stones. I have like 15 of those. I was lazy and I've used like three of them before it ever came up. Use a teleport stone. It's like, I've already used three. Okay, I'll use one more so I can complete this, your tutorial quest. <laughs> uh, I actually haven't used a teleport stone at all yet. Well, with the ability to turn the encounter rate off. You don't really need them. Mm -hmm. I was just being lazy. I didn't want to thread my way back out of the entire dungeon. I seem to remember one of the classes also having that ability now that I've unlocked where they can teleport out of the dungeon. I think you're correct, but I don't remember which class, and I know it's not one I have enabled right now. Yeah, I just can't remember it. Oh well, it's one of the mages that, that much I know. Probably time mage. Well, I think that wraps up our thoughts on the gameplay. Now on to sound. So far, the music's been really good. Quite catchy. Memorable to a point. Like, I forget it when I'm not playing because I, because I kind of zone out when I'm grinding. So, though I gotta say the music for the swamp, I believe it is, reminds me a lot of one of the songs from Nightmare Before Christmas. At least that's what keeps popping into my head when I hear the song. My brain hasn't made that connection, so I'll have to listen the next time I'm in the Swamplands. I definitely enjoy the music. I like the theming that the music and the sound effects do. Is I like playing off of audio cues. It's like, oh, this just gave me a heads up. This is about to happen. And all the sound effects are quite appropriate. Like when you hit someone and they're in default, it makes a kind of a ting sound like you're hitting armor because they have reduced damage while they're in default. And the monsters having different sound effects. Oh yeah, they all have unique sounds like the tree monster, I believe you first encounter in the swamp, makes this kind of ar, 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 when he comes into battle. Yeah, and I don't think I caught that the first time, or I was dealing with one of the other tree monsters, because so far I've run into two different kinds. They um, also do a little of palette swapping, because there are several enemies that are like different versions of the same creature you run into. Like, there's wolves, and then there's undead wolves, and then there's tree monsters, and then there's poison tree monsters or something along those lines, and they're just basically um, palette swaps of each other? Yes, same with the bats and the moths and uh, the light orb creatures. But it gives them a scope to give you different types of bosses without having to come up with more custom designs. I think we just dipped a little bit back into the gameplay there, but that's okay. <laughs> We're very tangenty like that. Yeah. Voice acting. There is a lot of vocalization in this game. I love how much voice acting they have in this game. Almost, actually, all cutscenes, except for party chats, are vo fully voiced. And except when you talk to villagers, then, you know, the NPCs don't talk that much unless a specific thing important to your quest comes up. So, it's very enjoyable at how much they've been able to fit. Because I know that in earlier RPGs, you know, on earlier systems, there were a lot of limitations just in software and hardware of how much could be done. And they're really doing a lot, and that's on top of all of the hardware and software capability that's taken up in giving us beautiful visuals and strong gameplay. Oh, well, I guess that's why the file itself, when you download it digitally from the eShop, is three gigs in size. I'm guessing most of it's sound. <laughs> Hmm, and I think that's one of many reasons I went with the physical cartridge. 
And the voice acting is really good so far. I haven't really had any super takes me out of the moment too hard moments other than except for the voice direction on idea that murgurger they seem to have like why did you have her spell out the sound it's more of a frustration sound so you just go Arr! or Arr! except murgurger that like totally takes me out of the moment every time she says it <laughs> i more want to laugh than be frustrated with her when she does that other than that her performance has been pretty good so far my favorite performance so far has to be ring a bell and for the listeners' references, Lux has been playing the game with English voice acting, and I've been mostly playing it with Japanese voice acting. Ah, uh, yes, we should have pointed that out from the beginning. Though you have switched back and forth to... Well, we both switched back and forth to compare the two. So far, I only prefer the Japanese voice actress for Anya's over the English voice actress, because I think, once again, a little bit of bad voice direction, maybe? Because the... English Anya sounds flat compared to everyone else. She doesn't really give, at least to me, much emotion. Especially when there's important lines where she's supposed to be sad and she comes off as, oh, I'm kind of sad. But when you listen to the Japanese voice actress, you can actually hear her almost coming to tears in those moments. That is, I think, out of the, the main four um, Party Quest characters, Anya is the only one where I have a definite preference. And it's for the same reason. The English on yes just sounds a little too much serene, unemotional monotone. And it's not bad. It's just when you compare it to the Japanese voice actress, there's more depth and emotional tone, which to me makes the character more relatable and makes some of the scenes feel more poignant. For Adia, because I first heard her in the Japanese, I didn't catch what you caught in the English until I went back and watched cut scenes later. Yeah, the whole murderer. I'm like, really? Why Why you're having her basically sound that out? It's not meant to be sounded out like that. It's supposed to be to represent a sound of frustration before she goes on with her line. Oh, but that could have also been a translation problem. Mm, kind of like how when they brought over Naruto for the English dub, they kept having, having him say, Believe it! Because that's kind of a general translation of... Delta Bio, I think he says in the Japanese one, which I never picked up. <laughs> no, I never noticed it in the Japanese, so it's another possible explanation. I like how young Adia sounds in the English one. And going back to Ring a Bell real quick, I'm actually, that, that's one of the Japanese voice actors. I'm like, ah, uh, he sounds a bit too deep for how I imagine the character, especially since I guess, I guess it's because I started with the English Ring a Bell and he has such. A pretty boy, and he has such a pretty boy voice to me in the English one. I was like, that's perfect. That works for him. And then I went back and listened to the Japanese. I was like, that sounds too deep for a pretty boy. Yeah, uh, I think in terms of the overall sound, there's probably the most difference between the English and Japanese voice acting for Ring a Bell. I do like both of them and could honestly go either way. The Japanese one is definitely deeper. And I do envision a lighter tone when I think of Pretty Boy Playboys. But the Japanese Ring of Bell has a very nice seductive tone. It just sounds older to me than I originally envisioned Ring of Bell to be. Yeah, especially with the way the character is drawn. He feels so young, so you expect him to have a slightly higher voice. And But then you hear the Japanese, and he has a voice around here. And you're like, that sounds too old. <laughs> Yes, but for a character with amnesia, you know, we are guessing. The American Tiz sounds really nice to me. He definitely has that innocent tone. He does the innocent character tone very well. I haven't really listened much to the Japanese, but he sounds quite sincere for the parts I have heard, which is what you want from a character like Tiz. Yes, I think in both the English and the Japanese, Tiz's innocence and sincerity both come through very well. So. It's all excellent. We are very privileged to have this much audio on a game, especially on a handheld. And to me, all of it just comes together very nicely in this awesome package known as Bravely Default for the Sound. It's just, you get the music, you get the sound effects, you have the voice acting, and it just works together really nicely. Shall we move on to art? Art design in this game is very nice. I like all the little touches 
brings out the feelings of the environments, like the desert has a lot of yellow and bright tones until you move into the Wind Temple, which is very holy, so it has all those gray and dim tones. And then you go to the Swamp Environment, which has greens and kind of a musky scent, and you have all the fog and everything that really makes it feel like a swamp. And then the character design is very well done. It really gives off what kind of character they are when you look at them. Tiz gives off that very boy-next-door country bumpkin. And then you have ring bell who comes off as very... Ah, I like myself, and I look pretty in the mirror. Hello, ladies. You like me, don't you? Look at me. I am pretty. <laughs> then you have Adia, who comes off, I'm a very strong woman. Don't mess with me. And then you have the kind of quiet, I've been sheltered for most of my life, Anya's. Now, it's very beautiful artwork. The character design is fantastic, not just in the main characters, but in most of the distinguishing NPCs. And you even have variety in the regular town NPCs. So you have a lot of not just well done art, but a lot of visual variety. Yeah, everything definitely has a unique look about it. Everywhere you go, things change to match the theme of the area. Like in the desert, people are wearing very desert clothings, covering themselves up to protect themselves from the sun. And when you're in a more woodsy area, people are wearing more clothes that would be appropriate for that area. And as we said before, the creature design is just very well done from the smallest slime-like creature to a giant monster with multiple heads. <laughs> and it looks really nice in 3D. I'm glad I'm one of the people who can actually experience that without getting a headache. Yeah, it looks very 3D even without the 3D being on. I showed one of my coworkers the intro movie and they were like, whoa, this is 3D, it's trippy. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't even turn the 3D on, chill out. Wow, that's interesting. No, I, I do try to turn the 3D on occasionally for cutscenes and when entering a new area, just for the visual impact, and then I turn it back down for um, gameplay and story progression. Yeah, I usually have it off during the overworld because I've noticed there's some spots where the frame rate takes a dive when the 3D's on. So I usually turn it off to keep the frame rate up so I can freely move around the world. But whenever I enter in a new location, I usually turn it on where it usually fades to black before the new area loads. I also usually try to have it mostly on when I know there's a cutscene going. Okay, we are about to go over into characters, story, and speculation. So if you do not want spoilers, we'd love you to stay with us, but we understand about spoilers. So if you do not want to hear any spoilers at this point, please skip forward to our conclusion, which is annotated on somewhere on your screen. <laughs> okay, so now let's really talk characters. Um, I think we should probably get the big one out of the way first. Or do we want to do the, the small ones we like and then move on to our favorite character? I do not think Ringabelle is content to wait, so <laughs> we may as well start with the pretty boy. Yeah, I don't know if we gave hints about it during the rest of this recording, but Ringabelle is our absolute favorite character so far. I don't know what it is about him that we both like so much. But it's, he just has this charm that even though he's an ass, you want to like him so much. And he says the darndest things where you just facepalm. No, he is a rake. He is entirely overconfident. Too much time spent on his appearance. But he's incredibly well written. He's very enjoyable to read his dialogue, to hear it spoken. Oh my god, Ringabel's voice actor is just... The American voice actor for Ring of Bell just does such an excellent job of delivering some of these lines, especially some of the ones where you're like, I can't believe they actually wrote that. I can't believe he pulled that off so well. Oh, and it's excellent in the Japanese as well, because you have that slightly deeper seductive tone <laughs> <laughs> that works really well when he's talking about, oh, it's my job to escort you. I never fail in to escort a lady. <laughs> uh I don't know if you've gotten to this part because it's, my brain has fogging on it, but he basically says, there's something wrong with this place. And everyone goes, what? There's no women. <laughs> oh, and we're on chapter two so far. I am still slightly ahead of her. 
So I'll try not to spoil hers too much. But if you have played beyond Chapter 2, this is completely safe to listen to, except perhaps for our speculations. The other characters are nice too. I like how Tiz kind of balances Ring a Bell, especially when Ring a Bell's like, come on, I want to make you a man. And Tiz is like, I'm already a man. I don't need to be your kind of man. Oh, but it's so much fun! <laughs> and then... Then Adia goes, ring a bell. I, I just see her grabbing him by the ear sometimes and just dragging him off and going, what, what? <laughs> now, and it's funny how even though ring a bell is attracted to Adia and, you know, thinks that she is the one, he's still flirting with everyone. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, hello, pretty lady. Can I flirt with you? Uh, sure. Hello, I'm flirting with you. And Adia's like, oi. <laughs> and then there's Anyas, who's... Her character's nice, but like I said, the voice acting makes it kind of flat for me, but she's so isolated in how she reacts to what others say about what's going on, and she's like, oh, I've heard about this, or I've never heard about that before. <laughs> yeah, she's very much the innocent, but she's innocent in a different way than Tiz or Adia. And she's, she's very sheltered, and she's very pure of thought. Uh, where Tiz is more innocent in the I'm from a small town, I've never been to the big city type of way. And I like how Tiz and Anyas are interacting and how he's the very, I am the knight in shining armor, even though I've never been in shining armor before. Can I be your knight in shining armor? I need to protect you. You need to protect me? Why? Because, well, I need to. <laughs> the story says so. But the story says so for good reason. Anya's is Tiz's hope. You know, she's her quest is to restore his home. How can he not be behind that? And in return, I think he gives her hope that she can actually complete her quest. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of moral support because he believes in her. And because she's been able to move him, I think it gives her some of the confidence that she can move the hearts of others. And going back to character interaction, I, I love how that they all just play off of each other very well. Like, there's moments where ring -a bell says something and Anyas is just like, No! <laughs> you are so sick! <laughs> ring -a bells like, What? And uh, Adia just went, Ugh, ring -a bell Yeah, it, it's hard to talk about one character at a time because they all interact so well. Oh, and speaking of other characters, I suddenly remembered the... I just want to call him the old perverted hermit. <laughs> the Sage of Yulana Woods. Mm-hmm. I just loved Adia's line of, Oh my god, it's a geriatric ring -a bell <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love how they got along so well. It's like, ooh, your fashions are marvelous. Women would just look so well, so good in these outfits. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you... I see you have the same defining eye as I. Oh, we'll get along swimmingly. <laughs> and apparently I've made him British. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's just that interaction in that particular scene was like, how everyone was like, oh my god, it's another ring a bell. Oh god, there's two of them. What's wrong with this world? And then later when it's like, oh, how can I repay you for this? You could cook me breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I actually agree with him. Home cooking is the best. And if you get stuck cooking for yourself long enough, and sounds like he doesn't know a lot of recipes, it can get kind of boring after a <laughs> while. So having a young woman come in who actually knows how to cook, cook for you would be awesome. Although that brings up the other conversation that happens later where, oh, I know how to cook. And then she starts describing her recipes, Adia, I believe. And everyone just goes, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just like, I would not have thought of that combination. I'm still not going to think of that combination. Adia, you're not in charge of cooking. Ever. Uh, <laughs> I believe that took place in a party chat. Yes. Oh, those party chats are quite informative, too, and I love how you can get back to them at any time in that wonderful little... Well, this is thing we haven't talked about when we're talking about ring -a bell He has a book that apparently can tell the future. And it also is the game device that allows you to review all the cutscenes, including the party chats, which are very handy because sometimes I accidentally hit the A button a little too quick and I, over, and I skip over some dialogue. I'm like, ah, I didn't mean to do that. 
Yeah, and I like to go back for the voice acted scenes and compare the Japanese and the English versions. And I also like to play them back for, wait a minute, this seems to relate to this and go back and see if I can make another connection in the storyline. And since we're talking about storyline, want to move on to that? Sure. Okay, so now we're going to stick with actual story. We're going to limit speculation for later. So since you're very good at summering and you probably have a better memory for this story than I do, why don't you do it? <laughs> okay, so we have the overarching story of the Vestal's quest to reawaken the crystals, which is our main party's quest. We have various tie-ins to that with Tiz joining because of his faith in Agnes and she wants to close the chasm that destroyed his home. We have Ringabel joining because of his journal, because he wants to meet Adia. And we have Adia joining because, wait a minute, I think my side was wrong. Yeah, I'm going to hang with you guys because my people are doing bad things and you're doing good things. So everything I know is wrong. Red Owl reference, check. <laughs> I like having a side quest in addition to the main quest. I like how they're clearly labeled with the blue as opposed to the yellow. I also like how the side quests actually give you more story to the main story. They give you like background workings that are going on. Yeah, so that it's something that actually ties in rather than, oh, go collect this and bring it to me. So, yes, collect me 15 mushrooms and bring them back. Okay. Am I like, are you going to pay me for this more than, here, have 15 coins. Yeah, I can kill monsters and get more than that. <laughs> Yeah, so I like that the side stories, I believe they call them subplots, really do tie back into the main story and overall enrich the world building and the story progression. Not to mention that that's where we got the thief class from. Definitely the fact that the side quests also have the added benefit of getting extra job classes. That's really nice. I like how you mentioned that. And I agree with you. Thief is one of my definitely one of my favorite job classes. <laughs> Mainly because it makes Ringabel look really awesome in that outfit. Plus, he's just wickedly good <laughs> in a thief class. He is amazing in the thief class. He wears earrings in the thief class. I kept going, what is that weird pixel when he turns his head that's flashing? He's wearing earrings? But he looks really good in thief class. The stats seem to fit him well. And while we're on the thief subquest, I have to wonder how the main game might have played differently if you didn't complete that subquest. Because if you didn't defeat the Time Mage, wouldn't he still be king? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, because I play every side quest because I want every job class possible. <laughs> yeah, I want the full game experience, so... Well, the nice thing is, this game, surprisingly enough, does have more than one save file. So we can go back through and play again and see what happens when we don't choose to do the side quests. I don't know that it would change too terribly much because we still shame the king in front of the people and he still withdraws. So we'd still be dealing with the prime minister. We just wouldn't have the entire shift that theoretically will occur in the Ang Chime government because we took the king out. So far it's really well written, but there is some cheesy dialogue here and there where you're like... Okay, is this just translation, or is this actually a cheesy dialogue? I can't really pick any more out in my memory right now, but I remember a lot of moments going, ooh. <laughs> I, I think I have a higher tolerance for that than you, or hearing it in the Japanese and just reading the translation gives me a higher tolerance. It's probably that, um, reading it subtitled compared to me who was hearing the English voice actors trying to say some of those lines going, ooh. <laughs> Like I said before, Ring of Bell pulls off most of them really well. I think it's also his character allows for it. Except with the others, where they're trying to be serious and the line just comes off corny, and you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, and the quest for the rainbow thread. I have some nitpicks. It's giving you a pause there to roll your eyes. In the opening movie, what Agnes is wearing looks a lot like the Vestal garb that the sage creates for her. So, to me, that implies that she already had a set of Vestal garments. She hasn't been to see the Sage since she was a child, so obviously that's not the clothing from her childhood. If the Vestal garments have to be custom made to each Vestal, and the Vestal has to go get the rainbow thread themselves, where did those Vestal garments come from that she was wearing in the opening movie? 
also if the Vestal had to get the rainbow thread and have the garment custom fitted, why did Agnes as the Vestal of Wind for, I think it was five years, never get this information from the Mother Vestal? Hmm. Never really thought of that, because I guess I just assumed that the outfit she was wearing was the other Vestals, and that's one of the reasons the whole dark thing happened, because it wasn't a custom fit. Well, that's the thing. If having a custom vestment is so important, why would it have not been taken care of in a time of peace? Because I could understand, oh no, the Vestal garments are all ruined. I mean, she was wearing a Vestal garment in the opening movie when the darkness attacked the temple, so... I have no problem with, okay, that's the outfit she escaped in and it was destroyed. And I have no problem with, oh, the vestments left in the temple were also destroyed, so we need a new one. That's all good. It's just, okay, if it needed to be custom, why didn't she know and why wouldn't it have been taken care of when she first became the Vestal of the Wind and took over from the Mother Vestal? Mm, yeah, I can see that little bit of plot stuff right there. Once again, you point out plot things that I don't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> and in chapter two, I'm just feeling a tiny bit, just a tiny bit insulted that this town of only women got consumed by dark fashion trends. <laughs> I think the reason it got consumed is because, well, it was probably a slow thing and the evil people, mainly that one summoner really influenced things in a bad way and i think it's because of the fact that these artifacts are basically cursed and that curse kind of is infectious that caused everything to start to go awry because even the um i don't know what you would call her even the matrians started went i don't know what happened it happened so slowly and then it snuck up on me and i couldn't do anything about it and she doesn't know what's going on because she hasn't really by well, the sound of it, really been outside to really look around and see exactly what's causing everything. Well, she knows that the change happened, but the change occurred so slowly and gradually and insidiously that by the time it became obvious, it was too late for her to be able to reverse it, which I can all see. Like I said, I was just a tiny bit insulted that the downfall of the town was fashion <laughs> in this town of all women. Yeah, I see your point. I love how Rainbow goes, oh... All full of innocent women. Hmm. <laughs> and I like how Tiz is going the other direction. Um, what do they do if a guy happens to come into town? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's okay for them to visit. They just can't live here. Phew. And ring a bell's all. Oh, so many ladies. Who should I flirt with first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that reminds me of the party chat where ring a and the ring a bell. Tiz is kept up because ring a bell comes in so late. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of a more recent party chat where he bought one of the ladies oh. he was flirting with the handbag. <laughs> yeah, that one. It's like, and afterwards, it just didn't feel right <laughs> or, or something like that. He basically says how after the handbag, everything kind of just fell apart. Yeah, because after that point, all I could see was the handbag and it just it came between them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, at least she wasn't a gold digger because she didn't break up with him after she got the handbag. He backed off from her. And I think he actually took some money from Tiz by the sound of the conversation. Because he says, isn't that right, Tiz? <laughs> I don't know for certain that he took money from Tiz for the handbag. But I know that when Adia went shopping and Ringabel st got stuck carrying all the packages, they took Tiz's wallet. <laughs> I'm just glad that's not coming out of my actual fund account. Mm -hmm. Actually, I should double check. I didn't look. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. I just think it's fun conversation that everyone's taking money from Tiz because Tiz is like the one who actually has all the money. Because <laughs> that's how the game's kind of implying it. Like, it may be group money, but apparently Tiz is the one who keeps the wallet. <laughs> He's the treasurer. Oh, and going back in story a little bit, oh, specifically that whole side quest in the sand town where... You have that one sword mage who is basically also uh, a warrior for hire. And the first two battles where you're fighting him and the other guys, he's like, well, you're not worth my time. <laughs> oh, my life may be in danger here. You can't afford me. Leave. I really like that. And then I liked how in the third battle, based on that, I focused on fighting him. Because I'm like, okay, once his HP gets low enough, he'll quit. And then 
Wait a minute, you're gonna stay to the end this time? Still gonna kill you. Have fun! <laughs> I did that too, like in the last battle, I'm like, I'm gonna get him out of the way first. If he stays around, I'll kill him. If he leaves, I'll kill him later. <laughs> now, moving forward a little bit, there's that whole side quest in Chapter 2 where you go and find out where the hairpins are coming from, and you get the summoner class. Yes, that has been the first point in a really long time where a side quest felt more important than the main quest. Because at that point, the main quest was get ready for the beauty pageant. A side quest, go rescue two children. That's much more rewarding. Go rescue two children. I'm going to do that. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I'll just follow this little blue icon. Because I actually wasn't, I didn't realize which. Because I actually found two side quests at the same time, so I wasn't quite sure which side quest went to which. So I just walked off towards the nearest blue icon, which is an indicator of where the next important spot of a side quest is. So I went there and found out, oh, this is about the two little girls. Okay, follow them into these woods to find the sacred fairy creatures. And then you find out that an evil summoner has been ripping their wings off and selling the wings as hairpins. And apparently when you kill one of these creatures in that way, the wings become a cursed artifact and will cause people to be extra greedy and show the extra greediness in their heart and make it so they want to desire these wings so much as hairpins that they will actually fight each other over them, even if you really love that person. And then we find out the little girls are fighting and you're going, okay, lady, you are going down. So... I braved out everyone except for my white mage and then used all four, I say all three of my bravely second points and went to the minus on that and killed her. <laughs> and I wish I had thought to do that. Like I said before, most of the time I kind of forget about bravely second. But yeah, I braved out my whole part. I didn't brave out my mage. I defaulted my black mage so that I had a chance to use examine to look for a weakness. And then, of course, I braved out Ring a Bell with the Angel Bow and Adia with her Valkyrie Spear. And I know you said you thought you saw a fire weakness, and I don't remember seeing a weakness for the summoner boss. And when I was like, okay, I don't see a weakness. I'm going to go with my first choice, kill it with fire! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I did, when I used all my Bravely Seconds, I focused on Anya's, who was my Black Mage at the time, and completely maxed her out on fire three. I shall cook you to death, you witch. <laughs> Too bad I don't have a stake. Otherwise, I'd burn you at the stake. Of course, then you find out. Oh man, the kids are dead. I'm so depressed. Good thing I killed her though. Makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, dang it. I wish we could have designated one of the party members to protect the children, and then just three of us fight her. Cause then maybe the kids would have lived. And then you go back to the town and report back, and she's like, oh. Oh, that's such, a, such sad news. Yeah, I know. I killed her, though. That can make you feel better. I don't know. <laughs> Flowers? Oh, wait. Too soon? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like one side quest ahead of her so far because I haven't continued on with the main quest. So any other story points you want to bring up before we go into... Oh, here's a story point that will lead right into speculation. The the little novel bit, uh, the little diary bit in the future storybook, as it were. Very early on... I read all the mysterious writings in the diary. I don't know that that was a good idea or not. Yeah, it seems semi spoilery, but since they included it so early in the game, I don't think it really is. Since you speculated that it's actually an alternate timeline to what's currently going on. It's actually the current timeline, especially since there's a point where even Ringabell goes, Hmm, I don't seem to be in here. I guess I'll just go along anyways. Because I can't leave you, Adia. Perish the thought. Yes. So... We are now going into full-blown speculation based on the gameplay that we've had so far, what we've read in the mysterious writings of the D Journal. Why don't you lay out your speculations first? <laughs> okay. My speculations regarding this is A. The D Journal belongs to Alternus Den, which is why it is written from such an anti-crystallist standpoint. My additional speculations include that Tiz's younger brother Till is still alive and is the boy that Alternus Din saves later in the later part of the journal. That just covers the straight timeline of the journal Alternus Din. Going to the journal's connection to Ringabel, 
My theory is that Ring a Bell is an alternate of Alternus Den. We do not see Alternus Den's face so far yet in the story. We see him only in the black armor. So most people would not recognize him if he and Ring a Bell do happen to look alike. The problem with this is that Adia and Alternus Din grew up together. I can't imagine that he was wearing armor from the time they were children. So Ringabel has to actually physically look different. Or perhaps Alternus Din had some disfiguring injury as a child that makes him not look like Ringabel. One of my supporting points for this is when Ringabel gets seasick quote unquote seasick right before Alternus Din shows up. Some story universe theories have that the original and an alternate cannot meet in the same place. So the closeness of the two could actually cause Ringabel, who I theorize is the alternate, from from feeling well and from being able to be near Alternus Din. I think there's also a clue in Alternus's name. Alternus Din. Alternate Din darkness. If you read through the entire journal entries, it sounds like Alternus regrets some of what happens in the original entries of the book. In the original entries, it reads that he is actually the one who rescued Tiz, he, which basically gave Agnes her first bodyguard. If Tiz had not been alive, Agnes would have been alone when the white mage and the monk came for her, at which point she probably would have surrendered and the Eternian forces would have won. Well, there's not much difference to my speculation other than the fact that I think Tiz, not Tiz, Pui. I think the boy is actually, in my current theory, the boy who Alternus saves is actually who we now know as Ringabel. And the reason he has the diary or the Alternus's Din's book is because that's what he has because, yeah, God, my brain says, he basically picks it up at some point. I can't really remember how I figured it out or how I would describe it, but he ends up with the diary before ending up where he currently is in the current timeline. And maybe instead of Alternus sending himself back to fix things, he sends the boy. And that's why Ringabel has no memory of what's going on. Also, there's that new little tidbit we both saw recently with the summoner saying, I sense two souls in you, and... Well, he, she senses two souls in him. And that gives us, like, a, a pause about something. Yes, because that gives um, ammunition for several different theories, depending on your interpretation. She also calls it beautiful, like her sister, which to me makes me think that the soul is a darker soul like perhaps the whatever was actively caused the chasm in Narende actually possessed Tiz in order to survive. And that's why Tiz survived, is because he had the power of that second soul. Though there's another point where the soul may actually be the soul of his brother, who you suspect is still alive, but there's also plenty of stories where the soul can live separately of the body and the body can still live on, especially if the soul is still alive in the same plane. Right. My main thing with saying that the second soul has an element of darkness to it is that that crazy summoner witch said it was beautiful. And to me, she has a very distorted view, so I could be t putting too much onto that. Yeah, I think w the way she says it's beautiful, she's comparing it to her sister. And from what Adia says, her sister is actually beautiful in real life. You know, the way she remembers her, she was actually not just beautiful as in good looking, but beautiful in spirit. And so that is a point towards it being a benign or kindly spirit. Mm -hmm. You also have the possibility that perhaps that second soul relates back to the journal. You know, maybe Ringabel has no memory because a fragment of his soul is actually inhabiting Tiz. And Tiz got all the nice innocent stuff. And Ringabel got all the rakish stuff. So we have the implied relationships. If you read the D journal, the person writing the journal feels a strong protectiveness towards Adia that does not necessarily equate to the romantic, lustful feelings that Ringabel has, which to me argues 
either against him actually being an alternate form of alternus or even being alternus at all because the latter journal entries the writer of the journal is stating how much they've always wanted a family and they will do anything to protect it and the drawing that goes with that to me looks like a younger version of the grand marshal a young version of adia and a younger woman who i theorize is adia's mother to me alternus in the first time he showed up in the cutscenes, seemed like a very loyal retainer. And the way the story has played out so far, feels like he's semi-adopted, not officially family, but owes a great deal of loyalty to the Grand Marshal. And because of being physically close to the Grand Marshal in his youth, grew up with Adia, and formed that loyal retainer, I must protect you no matter what because of what you did for me. All good points so far. Which, if ring -a -bell is a alternate or damaged form of alternus, still helps to explain his obsession with Adia. And ring -a -bell, looking at the journal entries, does not actually seem to ever be a part of the Vestals group. Ringabelle is never once mentioned by name, only Tiz, Agnes, and Adia for the Vestals side. And some of the early events that actually match up, like when Owen says that Ringabelle participated in the boar hunt, Ringabelle could have been part of that hunt because he already read about it in the book. And we don't know if Ringabelle was actually part of the rescue party to that saved Tiz or not because of the way the journal's written, it doesn't seem like Ring -a Bell would have actually written the journal in the for in the form and personality that we know him currently. Wow. You really went in depth in this. Yikes. I just have I basic told story. You I shouldn't have read them. <laughs> I had basic story, like, okay, I see this and this might happen, this might happen. This would be cool if this happened, and you're like this is all I've thought of, and here's the novel. Funk. <laughs> Dang, I only wanted a page report. I didn't want a novel. Yeah, and... Now that I'm complaining, I'm just pointing this out. I know, and now that you've interrupted, I can get back to why I think the boy that Alternus rescues is Till and not ring -a -bell. Because of how after Alternus rescues him, then the boy's muttering in his sleep, and he says something that stops Alternus cold. If Till was mumbling in his sleep and said, you know, Tiz, Onichan, you know, brother, Alternus would have seriously freaked. And it also gives a good reason why the boy Alternus rescued would beg to be taken along when Alternus goes to confront the Vestal's team. Also gives reason of why Adia would be going, let the boy go. Because if Tiz saw the boy and the boy was Till, Tiz would be seriously freaking out. You have plenty of good story points. <laughs> it is part of why I am so obsessed with this game. Is because I read the journal and I have all these theories and I want to know. <laughs> and me is just the gameplay. I, I, well, not just the gameplay. I like the story too, but it's mostly me going, I like kicking bad guys' asses. It makes me feel good. <laughs> Yes, well, I've dominated the speculation side, but how about you go into your theory that tied back to the Crystal Caravan? Oh, yeah, this is kind of a, as they call it, a spiritual successor to that line of games. We have um, the first game that ended up on the GameCube, then we had a sequel to that, and then we had another sequel to that, or a prequel, I can't remember exactly how it was, on the 3D, on the, on the DS at the time. And this is, from what I understand, kind of a spiritual successor to that. So this is actually, in my, in the way they wrote it, I think it's actually a connection to that world. And these crystals are actually the crystals from the Crystal Caravan world, where originally they had to be replenished by getting special water and bringing it and purifying the crystals with it. And in this world, it seems to be a specific girl that basically sacrifices her life, not in the normal way, but she has to live and always pray for the crystal to keep it purified. And... With the way the world's reacting, when the crystals are basically being overrun with darkness, it's similar to the way that the miasma would creep up on things without a crystal nearby. And that's how I see that this world connects to that world, and how it also shows that we could end up with 
being one of the stories where, oh wait, I've been the bad guy the entire time, or wait, we're actually the good guys, but the bad guys thought they were the good guys kind of story, because they thought they were actually fixing things, but they were actually making things worse. That's my speculation on that, anyways. Yeah, because both sides think that they're right. The Eternian forces are moving towards a goal that they think will benefit everyone, and the Vestal and her team are working to restore the crystals because they're seeing the detriment that the crystals being enshrined in darkness is causing to the land. So both sides feel that they are right, which is one of the great tension elements of this game. That it's not just black and white of, oh, I'm evil because I'm evil, though we definitely have some very villainous characters. We have reasons for characters to act the way they do. Yeah, it's very Japanese that way. Americans usually have a very black and white story. They give the bad guys reasons, but it's never, it's usually I'm a bad guy kind of reason. It's never, I'm doing this because I think it's right kind of reason. They, Japanese usually give a lot of depth to characters like this in stories like this, where you're not quite sure if the bad guy's a bad guy he's just a guy with the wrong reasons at the wrong time, you know. And at the other time, he may actually be a good guy, but in this instance, he happens to be the bad guy because his reasons are actually causing a problem and not actually solving anything. Okay, um, I think that's done with our speculation, so now on to wrapping this up with our basic thoughts on the game so far. <laughs> and if you skipped all our spoilers and speculations, welcome back. Oh, thank you. I think I'll go first this time. I like this game so far, if you can't tell by the... Oh, I don't know how long this is going to be this time until I'm done editing. But I like this game a lot. The battle system is really invigorating because this game brings a whole new battle system to the way Japanese RPGs have been done before, and it makes it fresh again. It makes it so... Turn-based battles aren't as boring as I'm hitting A all the time, I'm hitting A all the time. Oh, I have to stop because I want to use magic. So it's A, down, down, A, A, okay, summon. Wait for the summon to finish. Moving on. And I like how they do a lot of little tweaking to make things faster and make and makes the turn-based either funner or get out of your way so you can get along with the story. When you get into an important battle, they make sure to slow things down for you so you can go, oh, yeah, this is an important battle. I may want to strategize a little bit more. And overall, it just it's really tight so far. The controls, the gameplay, the art, the sound, just all of it comes together in a really good game. I can't wait to finish it. I hope it continues to be this good throughout. I am definitely ridiculously enjoying this game. It's beautiful, it's smooth, it's fun, it's interesting. To give you an idea of how much, other than the ridiculous length of this based on the fact that we're only into the second chapter of what has got to be an extremely long Japanese RPG, I bought my 3DS to play Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds. Since I started Bravely Default, I have not put my Legend of Zelda cartridge back into my machine. Yeah, and my Legend of Zelda cartridge is in my machine, but since I'm playing the downloaded copy, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have seriously become addicted to this game. As the title suggests, this is um, Bravely Default Anonymous. Hello, I'm Luxbrush, and I haven't been clean at all from playing Bravely Default. It's too addictive. Hi, Lux. Uh, I'm Ember. I'm still playing, too. Are you further than me? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I'm on this subplot, and I, I, I'm in chapter okay, this yeah. number. Further than me, but not by much. <laughs> Although, uh, here's, a, here's a funny comparison. I am like level 53 right now with a bunch of level 10 job classes. I mean, not just all my characters are at level 10 job classes. I'm talking about multiple job classes at level 10. And I am at level 28. None of my characters are at level 10 yet. Most are at 9 or 8. Uh, my secondary classes are at 6 and 7. But due to our differences in game style, we are almost at the same story point. I like to, like, grind like crazy. To the point of, like, I just did another couple more. Just another couple more levels. Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. Just a moment. No, I just need one more level. I, I just need one more level. Just one more level tonight. I actually ended up using the um, rebuilding of the village as a timer to stop myself from playing. I'm like, okay, it'll take an hour and a half for this building to be built. Okay, once that goes off, I'll stop playing. 
Because I've done marathon sessions like a couple of days ago. I I would just sat there and played for like two, three hours straight. Basically until my 3DS started going, I'm I'm dying. Look at the lights. I'm blinking red. I'm dying. Plug me in for God's sake. Well, thank you for listening this far. And I hope you've enjoyed our ramblings on Bravey Default. Hope you enjoyed yourself too, Ember. <laughs> um... The only downside to doing this recording is that I couldn't be playing Bravely Default while we were talking about Bravely Default. And if you liked our ramblings on Bravely Default, please check out these other videos we've done. And we hope you enjoy them. Well, I've been Luxbrush. And Ember. And this has been our thoughts on Bravely Default so far.